Hey everyone, welcome back. We are kind of going through the different offerings in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. Um, I'm actually, right now we're on Leviticus chapter 4, which is the sin offering. And uh, one chapters 1 through 5 are kind of the instructions for the people about the offerings. And then verses uh, 6 and 7 are to the priest on what to do with the offerings once they get them. Uh, there's some really good stuff in here. I've kind of talked about what they meant to the people back then, what how we can apply them to our life, and then also what they speak to prophetically. What is the foreshadow of all the different offerings? So um, we're going to go through Leviticus chapter 4. I'm not going to read every verse because it would just take too long. So um, if you want to stop and read through it first, or if you want to listen to it, then you can go back and read it, however you want to do it. I'm just going to hit on some um, certain scriptures, but not read through all of them, just for time's sake. So, we'll just start out at verse 1 and 2, and it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done, and does any of them. So, what the first thing we see is it says, If a person sins unintentionally, the idea not being so much like accidental sin, but a sin committed by a person who lives their life generally in obedience to the law um, and surrender to God. And, you know, they they do pretty good, but yet they do have this sin that they commit um, usually out of like a weakness, you know, one of their weaknesses. It's not outright rebellion, because we'll see that later. But most of the things that we deal with um, today are going to be what would be under this unintentional sins. Because the other thing would be a presumptuous sin, and that would mean like literally having going in rebellion against God, having a, a no respect for the law, a disregard for God, no fear of God, and just going out and doing whatever you want because you just want to do it, and that's what you're going to do. Now, these are some, you know, this would include like bondages and addictions and all that. Because um, it's not that you're just being outright um, defiant against God. It's just we're weak, we fail. So it's kind of the, the difference between like human frailty, frailty, is that a word? Frailty and the sin of outright rebellion. So here we see the difference here. So these sins deal with somebody who's trying to live by the law. They're doing the best they can, and then they mess up, and then they do something. Now, it can be something where you become defiled and you don't know it for a time. Um, but these sins also cover, like, if you do something and then you repent of it later, you come and you confess it. So that would also be covered under this unintentional sin. So the only thing that's not covered is for those presumptuous sins like in numbers 15 30 where you just have no regard for the law you're just going to do it and you don't care what god thinks so our weakness versus rebellion that's kind of what we're talking about here the root word of this the root of this hebrew word is translated um for the word unintentionally is kind of to wander to get lost you know, no one intends to get lost. You start out on the right path, and somehow you just wander off. You veer off in the wrong direction, and then you're lost. But if you're lost, you still need to be rescued. So even though you don't, you know, you don't set out the sin, you still need that sacrifice to take care of that sin because it still happened. So in Numbers fifteen thirty, like I said, you can read about the presumptuous sin, and this is literally means to sin with a high hand um no respect for the law you don't really care you're just going to do your thing there was no atonement available under the old covenant law for this kind of sin the one whose heart was defiant against the lord so thankfully today we know first john 1 9 we have a mediator we have atonement available for our sins um the only thing that we don't have forgiveness for is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 12, 31 and 32. 
Uh, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. So, all other sin, though, can be forgiven. Leviticus 4.2 is the first time sin appears in Leviticus. The Hebrew root of this word essentially means to miss. It's the same root word that's used in Judges 20 verse 16 describing those men who were using the sling and they would hit, um, throw a stone and they could not miss. So it's the same word about like having a target and you're aiming for it and you miss. At the heart of it, of this word in Hebrew, it's kind of that missing the mark, the failure to attain something like God sets his standard of holiness and we fail to attain it. Um, it also kind of means we're out of harmony with someone. We're not in that right relationship with them. In this case, it's God is the one that's harmed. And we kind of get this, this concept with David in Psalm 51 verse 4. He says, against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, how can David, so the kind of the, the context of this scripture is David um, had an affair with Bathsheba, and then when she became pregnant, he had her husband Uriah killed, and so there was just this big mess. So you would think that if you're looking at all this situation and you're like, I can see David sinned here and he sinned against this person, especially Uriah. I mean, he was an innocent person in this and he ends up being put on the front lines of the battle and, and pretty much killed intentionally. So you would think that David would be like, okay, I sinned against Uriah and I sinned against God. But he says, God, against you and you only I have sinned. Because when we sin is always towards God. Yes, we can sin toward other people, but it's ultimately against God. God sets the mark, and we miss it. So, and when we're caught up in repentance, and, you know, when we're, we're in that state of repentance, crying out, it's like, it feels like God, and we've failed Him so bad, and it just hurts so bad when we when we miss it. And that's why it's easy to cry out and say, God, I've sinned against you. Because our focus is God. So then when we mess up, it's like, God, I've sinned against you. And even though we've hurt other people, the sin is ultimately against God. In the New Testament, um, sin is considered breaking the law. 1 John 3, 4. So we have these sins that are unintentionally. This is... This recognizes an aspect of sin and where we are in danger of thinking of it lightly. And I think too many people think of sin lightly today, and that's why we see the kind of things that we do. There's this great tendency to imagine that sin is only in the will, therefore it doesn't hurt anything to have the thoughts. It doesn't hurt anything to imagine things. So... There is a sense in where it's true, where guilt kind of attaches to the sin once it's been committed, more so than when it's just in the thought life. But we take such a light view of sin that sometimes it makes it easier to go through with it. If we seen sin the same way that God sees it, then it would be a lot harder for us to give in in times of temptation. And then when we think that it's okay to have it in our heart, to have it in our thought life, as long as we don't act on it, that, that's where it's conceived, is in the mind and the, the heart, and then it's birthed out and manifested in the natural through our flesh. But if we've seen sin, how God sees it, then we wouldn't just give in so easy. Sin's only intent is to destroy you. That's it. It's come to kill you, to destroy you, to take everything you love, and to destroy it, to make you miserable. That's why God makes it so clear in his word that we are to stay away from it. We're not to, to walk close to it. We're not to try to, to see how close we can get to it without actually sinning. 
you know, that whole thing where it's like, I'm going to see what I can get away with. Or like little kids sometimes, like, let me see just how far I can push this before I get in trouble. And we go and we play with the fire. And then, you know, like that, I'm sure it's played out metaphor, we end up getting burned because we're not meant to play with fire. We're meant to stay back. We're meant to be holy and separate and, and set apart from those things and to stay back here when the line's up there. But yet we want to walk real close to that line. And say, Let's see what I can get away with because sin is kind of fun sometimes, right? Even the Bible says sin is fun for a season, but then once that season's up, it's time to pay the, the wages and that wages is death. So it comes to destroy you, but it makes it look enticing and fun. Sin doesn't always come as something gruesome and horrible where we're just like, oh, that's so horrible. No, it comes as everything we want and we're like, oh, well, this is nice. This is enjoyable. This is fun. And then the next thing we know, that season of fun is over and it's like, okay, it's time to pay up. What is that? It could be your marriage. It could be your health. It could be whatever that that sin has came to destroy. But yeah, we want to play around with it. That's something that we have got to get. We've got to get it. We have got to get it. We want to play around with this stuff, not knowing that that thing that we're playing around with is going to kill us, is going to destroy us in some way. And I don't always just mean kill as in physical. I mean, it's going to kill us spiritually. It's going to kill our, our hope, our faith, you know, and we just think it's okay to mess around with because especially those that nobody knows about, you know, those secret sins, those hidden sins that only you know about, well, only you and God, right? And we're like, well, it's not hurting anybody. Nobody else even knows about it, but that thing is slowly destroying you and you don't even realize it. We play around with these things. We think, oh, it's okay. And the next thing you know, you're, you don't even recognize your life anymore. Because it has come and has done its job. Because it is very efficient at what it does. Sin is very efficient. Maybe we think that we're getting away with it because I haven't seen immediate repercussions for this. I did this, but I didn't see any backlash. I seen this and nobody knows about it. I, I did this. and So we're like, couldn't be that bad, right? When all along... Sin is being like a silent killer, and it's destroying slowly. A lot of times it's destroying from the inside, and we don't even recognize it until it's too late. Next thing you know, we have no faith, no hope. We have no relationship with God because it says in the Word that your sin has separated you from God. But we don't even know we're separated from God because that's what sin does. It comes in and destroys our relationship with the Lord, and then we don't even know how bad it is until it's too late. We cannot play around with this stuff. So many people just want to play around with sin and have fun with it for a while. And then once it maybe it gets starts getting a little bit too bad, then, okay, then we'll repent and get away from it. But by that time, it's too late. It's either been exposed, so now other people know and your reputation is destroyed, or it's just killed you spiritually. God says stay away from it because he knows what sin will do to you. He knows it has come to destroy you, to maim you, and to kill you. But yet, we're like, eh, maybe it's not so bad. It is so bad, and it's a lot worse. So, the next time you're tempted to sin, stop and think that the only thing that this is going to do is going to rob from me, going to kill me, going to destroy me, but yet, I'm actually sitting here contemplating giving in. No. God wants to give us freedom from these things. The Bible says that we are free from sin if we have been crucified with Christ. So we don't have to live in bondage anymore. Read Romans. But we say, I'm just stuck in it. And I know sometimes it feels like it. Sometimes it feels like there's no way out. But there is hope. And his name is Jesus. And he can set you free as long as you continue to call upon his name. Some people kind of get tripped up with this language of unintentional sin. They think maybe, you know, it's just accidental sin. But most of the sin we deal with today will fall under this category. It's not just things done in ignorance, even though it can be things done in ignorance. But there are bondages, addictions, failures, 
that cause us to have this weak spiritual state to where we don't have the strength to fight and we don't do what we're supposed to do. We don't pray. We don't seek God. We don't call out for help. So yes, we fall into this sin. And we, it, it's, I mean, there's no excuse for it. We use our own willpower or we use our own will to decide we're going to sin. It's not like we accidentally, you know, drink too much. And then before we know it, we're, you know, we made that choice to do it. We didn't accidentally watch porn. We didn't accidentally, you know, shoot up or whatever the case may be, whatever it is we're doing. We didn't accidentally lie. We chose to say that thing. We chose to manipulate. We chose to gossip. Sometimes it feels like we didn't choose because sometimes we're just going along and we do it and we say it. But that's what I'm talking about. That's our, our weaknesses and our frailty as a human being. But yet we still choose to do those things. So there's nothing that we can say, well, or, you know, like that old saying, I don't think people use it that much anymore, but you used to hear, well, the devil made me do it. You know, maybe it's your flesh that made you do it. We can't make excuse for sin. We just need to own up to it and repent of it and cry out for the Lord to help us to overcome these things. Addictions are tough. Trust me, I know. I've had several, and they are tough to overcome. But the Lord has brought me out, not because I've been strong enough or good enough, but because of His grace and mercy, He's brought me out, and He will do so for everybody. But sometimes it is an all-out war to get free, but you can have hope that you can be free. God made a distinction between sins unintentionally done and those done presumptuously. A sin against any of the commandments had to be dealt with. And that's kind of what we see in James 2, 10, and 11. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who says, do not commit adultery, also says, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So he's saying, you know, you could try to keep the whole law. You can do everything so good, but if you mess up in one point, you're still a lawbreaker. You're still a transgressor of that law. You can't say, I keep the law, I just don't do that. That was the whole point of the, the law back then. There were 613 of them. Can you imagine trying to keep 613 commandments? You couldn't do it. In the same way, though, we can't say, well, I follow Jesus, but I'm okay with murder. I follow Jesus, but I'm okay with adultery. I, you know, and I know those are extreme, like it's probably not anybody that's going to say that. But we can't follow Jesus and say, I'm his disciple, but I'm okay with that, even though he says it's not okay. What he says goes. He says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You say you love Jesus? Do you keep his commandments? But in verse 16, though, he goes on to say, I will ask the Father and he will give another helper to be with you forever. John 14, 16. So in verse 15, he says, hey, you want to prove that you love me? Then keep my commandments. But some of those commandments, Lord, are hard and I don't know if I can do it. I'm weak. I struggle with this. And he says, well, that's okay because I'm going to send you another helper and he's going to be with you forever and one of the things that he's going to do when he's with you is help you overcome these things to help you keep my commandments we can't do it in our own strength but we have the holy spirit who lives with us to help us overcome these to help us to to keep the commandments of god so when we can't do it on our own we have the holy spirit to give us strength and grace in those times of need when we are weak he is strong so he will help us. He will pull us up out of the pit. He will put us on solid ground and he will help us overcome any addiction, any human weakness that we have. He will never fail. When we fall, we call upon the Lord to help us. When we fall, we call upon Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, I need your help. I can't do this. I don't have the strength in me to do this, but I know that you do and I know you want me free. It is your will that I am free from this thing, so please help me to overcome it. And we keep on asking as many times as it takes. If we've messed up 20 times, we continue to repent and call out 20 times. 
The only way we're truly defeated is when we quit calling upon his name, when we stay down and we just say, I can't do it anymore. We fall again and again, but when we ask for forgiveness and help to overcome it, he is faithful. I've seen it in my life many times. It may be a battle, it may be a war, but he is faithful. And that's the thing we've got to remember, that he is always faithful. He will pull us through. Our part is to do our best and to trust in him and to call upon him when we can't do it and to ask for forgiveness when we fail. Proverbs twenty four sixteen for a righteous man falls seven times. A righteous man. It doesn't say when the sinner falls. It doesn't say, you know, when the the wretched person falls, when the wretched man falls, when the righteous man falls. And he'll fall. He will fall. But it goes on to say, and rises again. So the righteous man falls, but then he gets back up. I'm going to fall, but I'm going to get back up, and I'm going to keep going. I will rise again, and I will continue on my path, and I will, God, forgive me. I'm sorry for doing that. You know, we come in humble, surrender to him, knowing that we've failed. We don't try to play it off. We don't try to, well, you know, I, I was set up. and I, No, we just admit it. We come to him. Yes, I've screwed up, but God, I'm, I'm asking for help because I don't want to do that thing. The only time when we have to worry is when it doesn't bother us when we sin. If we are able to sin without conviction, if we're able to sin without feeling that, that godly sorrow when we can do it and it doesn't affect us, that's when we're in trouble. And then we need to switch our prayer to, God, convict me of this. I don't want to be able to do these things. you know. And we need to start putting our prayers towards that that we get that conviction that the Holy Spirit will will make us feel that godly sorrow for sin. But if we are feeling convicted when we sin, that's a good thing. We ask for forgiveness and we continue on. As the chapter unfolds, we see that God directs these sacrifices for the unintentional sins for for different groups. First is for the priest, the anointed priest which is probably speaking about the high priest, but all the priests were anointed um, for Israel as a whole, for the rulers, and for the common person. So there's those different groups, from the highest to the lowest. God cared about all the sin. He wanted everybody to be taken care of, everybody to be able to offer this sacrifice so that they could be forgiven. The order that God places it in is interesting, because first he says, we got to deal with the priest we got to deal with the anointed priest. Then the nation as a whole. Then the rulers. Then the common people. A lot of times, especially in our society, we want to say, well, the rulers are first. You know, then maybe the people, the priests, and then, or the nation, the priest, and then the common people. But God puts those who are representing him first. Those who are representing him to the people are the ones that are top of the list. And then the nation as a whole. And then the rulers, because the rulers are supposed to be the good for the nation. The rulers are supposed to try to lead and guide the nation in a godly way back to God based upon, you know, the priest and the prophets and all that. So then you have the common people. So at the head, God places the priest. And then he looks at the nation. Um, then you can go to, to verse 3 through 12 and look at the sin offering for the priest. Um, it's interesting, though, because it says, If the anointed priest, priest sins, bringing guilt on the people. So if the priest needed a sin offering to be made on his behalf, it was a bull that was sacrificed. And then the priest identified it with the, the laying on the hands. But if the the priest sins, he brings guilt. Okay, if the leader sins, or the ruler, his sin brought guilt upon himself. If a common person sinned, it brought guilt upon their self. But it says if the priest sins, he brings guilt upon the nation. He brings guilt upon the people. So, it's just interesting how, I believe, God held them to a different standard. So, he's saying if you sin... You bring guilt on everybody. One, it might be because the priests are saying, 
we need to do this and and you know as a priest or leading then the people follow which brings guilt on them but i also believe it's because they are held to a a stricter standard uh, we see this in James 3 1 this principle is applied to the teachers and even I know in my own life with certain things I've had to really try to weigh my weigh my actions lately and and what I talk about and to who I talk to these things about because I know there are certain people who will look to me to see how I feel about something as well as they do with you and being in any type of leadership, being in any type of place of authority over anybody, being in a place where you can sway people's opinion, you've got to be really careful, especially when it comes to spiritual things and, and their relationship with the Lord. When you're responsible for other people, and, and yes, we know that everybody's responsible for their own relationship with the Lord. There's, I mean, you know, you're not going to go to heaven and say, well, this person said, or whatever. But we've also got to understand that to some degree, you're responsible for somebody else's walk with the Lord. Whether that be through your actions, through the way you speak to them. Um, just think about a husband and wife. If the husband is not saved and the wife is, but yet she lives in a way that causes um, reproach on the Lord, or if she lives in a way that causes that husband to kind of be like, why would I want that? you know like the way you act and you want me to be a christian so that might push him farther away you think that wife's not going to be kind of responsible for that and god's not going to see that the same way as parents with their children if the parents are in church but yet they go home and they they scream and yell at their kids and they they you know act like a fool all the time and they do things they obviously shouldn't be doing do you really think that God's not going to hold them accountable if those kids, like, you see what I'm saying? Like, you have influence in various circles. It might just be to one or two people. It might be to hundreds of people. Um, it might be to thousands of people. And that influence puts you at a higher standard. God's going to judge you more strictly. God is going to require more out of you. So if I just would sit at home and read my Bible to myself and try to live my life according to the, the standards that God has set out, try to live a biblical life, love people, and that's all I did, then you know that's great. But as soon as I step out and I start teaching the Word of God or preaching the Word of God, and now I have certain people who are influenced by what I say because I say that I've studied this and this is what the Bible says, that's going to put me at a higher accountability. So you think, well, wouldn't it be easier to just sit at home then and read your Bible and try to live your life, you know, that way so that you're not held to such a standard? And to that I say no. Because God will also hold you accountable for the things he's given you that you're not using. Look at the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, I believe. Um, that one that took the talent and hid it because he was scared, he wasn't commended for that. Go read it, Matthew 25, um, uh, 14 through 30. So... We're accountable for the things that God gives us to use them, but then we're also accountable for how we use them. I'm accountable for the gifts that God has given me. So if God has placed a teaching gift on me, I'm accountable to use that. Because can you imagine standing before God and Him saying, I anointed you to preach the Word, why didn't you? Or I called you to preach the Word, why didn't you? Well, God, I was kind of scared. Is that going to fly? I have called you to preach the word why did you only tell them what they wanted to hear why didn't you preach the whole truth either way we're going to be accountable so what we need to do is to do what God's called us to do to the best of our ability but take it serious if we're going to teach we need to study we need to really make sure that we're not just up there 
saying what tickles people's ears, what they want to hear, what makes them feel good. We got to say the truth of the word to the best of our ability. Are we going to get it all right? No. But we do the best that we can. God looks at the heart on these issues, and that's why we got to take it serious, take time and study, and not just read through it flippantly and then get up there and think that we're going to teach God's word. We got to make sure that it's a priority, it's a holy thing to be able to teach the word of God. So when we do so, we got to make sure we're doing it out of a right heart and with time invested. Because we're accountable for these things. There are people watching you. There are people who you influence probably daily. They're watching you to see how you react, how you act. Does your walk line up with your talk? Or do you say things and act a different way and then just bring reproach on the Lord? Because then, you know, I used to hear all the time. At a place I worked, I'd be trying to get people to come to Jesus and, you know, come to church and all this different stuff. And I'd be talking to them and they'd say, well, I know a couple Christians. They're out at the bar every Saturday. They drink and cuss and they get in fights. And he says, I'm actually a better person than they are. And I hear that all the time. I used to hear that all the time that, well... I'm as good a person as they are, so why would why do I need to go to church? Why do I need Jesus? Because I'm actually a better person than them. And, you know, you can get in the whole, well, we don't look at people, we look at Jesus, he's our example, but they don't want to hear that. Somebody who's not saved to go into church is not going to want to hear you talk about how, oh, we don't look at Christians, we look at Jesus, because, you know, we're just flawed people, saved by grace. They don't care about that. They expect a follower of Christ to act like Christ. They expect, if you say you're a disciple, if you say you're a Christian, that you should be more like Jesus than they are. And, that, and sometimes people are Christian in name only to where they call themselves a Christian, but they sure don't act like one. And people see that and they're like, why do I need Jesus? We are a living epistle. We are what people see. And when they look at us, that's what they expect to see out of Jesus. So we need to do our part to live right and to, to live biblically according to the Word of God. And if you say you're a Christian and you've been serving the Lord for 10 years and you still act like a fool every, every other day, then you really need a heart checkup because there should be some kind of heart change to where you don't want to act like that anymore. And if you're okay with that kind of lifestyle, but yet you say you're a Christian, then it really, I mean, it's really sad that that happens. Because we are supposed to be representatives. We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sent out into this world to make disciples. How can you do that when you act worse than the world does? So, again, the priest who sins brings guilt upon the people. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was made sin for us, that we could become righteousness. That word sin in 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the same Greek word used in the Septuagint, which was the, tr the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, and it translates to sin offering. So 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says, God the Father made Jesus Christ our sin offering. So we've seen Jesus as the burnt offering, as the grain offering, as the peace offering, and now he's our sin offering. Jesus was the sin offering. We see that there was this idea of laying your hands on the head of the, the sacrifice. It was, it was meaning, there was meaning to it, uh, like for confession of sin, for a consent to the plan of substitution, saying, yes, I agree that this animal is standing in my place. It's taking my place it's, and I'm transferring my sin to it symbolically so that I can be freed and forgiven. 
and there was a dependence because when you leaned on this, when you laid your hands on it, it wasn't just you lay your hands on it like that. I mean, you put all your weight on it. You leaned on that thing. But there was also a simplicity to it. As complex and full of wisdom as the plan of God was for salvation, he also made it easy on our part. We don't have to come with anything except wanting to be forgiven and wanting you know, him to transform us. In the this, this sacrifice, there was no like ceremony that had to take place. There was nothing done to the man's hand. He didn't have to have anything in his hand. He just came with his hands open, laid them on that sacrifice. That's all there was to it. And today we come with our hands open, our heart open. We say, God, forgive me of my sins. I know I'm a sinner. You know, I don't, And I'm not saying that I completely agree with that sinner's prayer, that we have to pray this this sinner's prayer and do it all right to be forgiven. We just have to come with a heart that wants forgiven and we call upon Jesus. That's all. It's easy on our part to be forgiven. We come to him in true humble submission, wanting our sins forgiven, and he does. It's not like we have to go through some ritual. It's not like we have to come with enough good works. None of that's going to make it. Jesus did it all. We come to him with nothing in our hands. Nothing we can do. There's no work of our hands that can be done. Salvation was God's doing. So, in, with the priests, when they sinned, the blood was taken inside and put on the, uh, the curtain, the, the veil. We don't see that with other sacrifices. So this shows the seriousness that God seen with the sins of the priests. The priests were the leaders. They represented God to the people. They were more accountable. We need to be aware of our actions because now it says that we are all priests. We are a kingdom of priests. We are accountable. We are going to be judged more strictly. And the more we know, the more we're accountable for. So... So the more we grow, the more we know, the more we learn, the more we become accountable. we got to take that all into consideration. When you represent God to someone, you need to be aware of your actions. And representing God to someone just means that they look at you as a Christian, like you've been saved, and now you're living that life. I don't know how many times people have come up to me at work and be like, hey, isn't so-and-so a Christian? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure. Well, then why do they cuss? And see... This is someone who doesn't go to church, doesn't want anything to do with God, but yet they recognize that that person says they're a Christian, but yet there are horrible things that come out of their mouth. And you know, it might not just be cuss words, but it's foul, foul talk and raunchy jokes or whatever it may be. And they recognize that they say they're a Christian, but yet listen to what's coming out of their mouth. And he's like, I noticed that you don't cuss. And I'm like, no, I you know, the Lord delivered me from that years ago because I used to have a horrible mouth. And one of the first things that happened when I got saved was the Lord set me free from that because I know it's not something I did because I couldn't, like, I cussed all the time. So it was only through the power of the Holy Spirit that kept me from being able to to say some of the things I used to say. But it just goes to show that people are watching and paying attention. And when you say you're a Christian and you live like the world, people are aware of it. Just think, I mean, being a pastor has got to be a hard job. I'm not a pastor, but I can only imagine. And what if people, I mean, the pastors are scrutinized on their teachings, plus how they live and the things they say out of the pulpit, as well as what they say in the pulpit. And can you imagine people being like, well, the pastor does it, so so can I. That person goes to church, and they still cuss and drink, and so why can't I? And even though it'd be nice if, you know, like people would only focus on Jesus, that's never going to happen. They're going to watch you. And maybe you feel liberty to do something that may not be a sin, but 
someone else may see it as that way because they have a different conviction about it. So we got to be careful in these areas. Um, maybe you think it's okay to drink a small amount of wine before bed, but maybe, um, you know, you're not getting drunk. You're just taking a few drinks to relax or whatever. And maybe that's not necessarily a sin, but what if your husband or your wife or your kids or, your, you know, your friends that find out about it, they do think it is. Is it okay for you to do that thing, even if it's not a sin? Is it okay for me to do something that may not be a sin for me, but yet it affects someone else because they feel like it is a sin? Should I just be like, well, it's not a sin, so you need to get over it? Well, I don't want to give my opinion, so we'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul's kind of dealing with this here, and he's talking about food offered to idols, but we could, you know, use it, we could apply it to this too. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, he will not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, the weak person is destroyed, the brother for who Christ died. So he's saying, you know that these are not gods, these idols. And so you might not have a problem eating that food. But yet if somebody walks along and they're like, can you imagine somebody walking along and being like, oh, that's Paul. You know, he, here he is, this apostle traveling the world, spreading the gospel, and he's eating in a temple food dedicated to idols like you know that could really hinder somebody and maybe somebody looks up to you as somebody who they can go to that they they trust and they see you doing something that they may view as a sin and it says thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it's weak you sin against christ Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. When I was studying and I read this, man, it really hit me. Because there's some areas in my life where I'm just like, there's nothing wrong with that. And I know that you may not like it, but it's not a sin. I'm not doing anything wrong, so I'm going to keep doing it. And that was such a wrong attitude to have. And I had to ask the Lord to forgive me because... I shouldn't do something that's going to make someone else stumble. We shouldn't be a stumbling block. And if I know that this action causes that person, it's not something the Lord told me to do. It's just something that I've always done. And if that action is going to cause somebody else to stumble in a way, then in, in essence, I'm kind, kind of in that point sinning against them because I know that they have, it's kind of hard to explain, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. They might not see it the same way. They don't have that same liberty. And so then by me wounding their conscience may cause them to really struggle. Paul says, paraphrase, I'll become a vegetarian if me eating meat will cause my brother to stumble. If me eating meat will cause you harm in any way, I will, I will be a vegetarian the rest of my life. That's the attitude we should have, not would you get over it, like there's nothing wrong with it. Because to them, they might see something wrong with it. Say you listen, and I don't listen to secular music, haven't from pretty much day two of my salvation when the Lord told me to throw away all my CDs that I had back when we had CDs and the CD cases were like that big. But you might think that there's nothing wrong with secular music. So you listen to it, but somebody else really does. And you're just like, there's nothing wrong with it. Here, listen to this. You know, that is so wrong because if they have a, a true conviction that that is wrong, we should respect that and not cause that person to stumble by just telling them to get over it, basically. Not saying you can't go home and in your private time listen to whatever music you feel comfortable listening to. But we've got to be careful not to be a stumbling block. That's the whole purpose of what I'm trying to say here. Don't cause somebody else to stumble just because you feel like it's okay to do something. 
Paul obviously felt it was okay to eat that meat, but he says, if it's going to cause you to stumble, I'll never touch this stuff again. And here we are like, would you just get over yourself? Something taken into consideration. It says that the blood of the bull was collected and applied by sprinkling it to the veil in the tabernacle of meeting, to the altar of incense, and the remaining blood was poured out at the base of the altar, the burnt offering, outside the tent of the tabernacle. In verse 6, it said they sprinkled the blood on the veil seven times. What did the writer of Hebrews liken that veil to? Hebrews 10, 20, By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, the, the body and the flesh of Jesus. So this was a prophetic picture of the blood in his body. So it says they sprinkled the blood seven times on the veil and jesus bled from seven places his head his back his side his two hands and his two feet that's seven it was all a prophetic picture of jesus all of this points to jesus the sin is an offense against the holiness of god and the veil guarding his holy presence must receive that sacrificial blood and there were times where the the veil would get so weighted down by the blood that they would have to change it without actually looking upon the Ark of the Covenant. But that's what some historians say, that it would get so heavy that they would have to change it without looking upon that Ark. The sin affects our prayer life. That's why the blood had to be put on the altar of incense, which represented the prayers of God's people. So that blood had to be a prayer applied to that because when we sin we don't feel like we can come to God right you know when you sin then you feel that guilt and that condemn condemnation and it's like the last thing we want to do is go before a holy God we just feel like we're not worthy we can't do it we don't want to pray we don't want to praise and I felt when I was at church the other day I had my eyes closed and the pastor was praying and there had been like what seemed like a, a brass ceiling or a bronze ceiling and every week, like a little bit would chip away, but not much. And then last Sunday, it was, seemed like this, this flood of light came in and a big portion of it just crumbled. And 